I am very delighted to be with you this evening, and I'm going to ask if you would to take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark's Gospel. I've been preaching through the uh, Gospel of Mark uh, at chapel on Sunday mornings, and um, wanted to take the time to look at this particular passage. Uh, just a, a little brief synopsis of myself. Uh, I was born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, I graduate of Covenant Seminary, uh, pastor of church for eight years in Rock Hill, South Carolina, three years in Hopewell, Virginia, and I've been at uh, Chapel in the Gardens for the last 20 years. So I found a very good uh, landing spot and uh, just love the folks there very much. Now, we are an older congregation, so that may be uh, one reason why some are not here this evening. Um, also, there are some that are still wrestling with uh, some of the pandemic uh, and the COVID items, so Appreciate your prayers for them as well. Um, currently, though, I'm part-time at chapel. I uh, was working uh, full-time as a hospice chaplain, but not doing that in the bereavement, uh, bereavement coordinator. But I'm also part-time chaplain at Memorial Hospital. So if there's anybody, if you're ever at Memorial, uh, have a need for someone to come see. Right now, pastors can come, but um, we're very limited. If you've had anybody to be at, cha at uh, Memorial, you'll know you're very limited uh, in, in, as far as our visitation right now. So I'll be more than happy to visit uh, whomever uh, with you. The other thing that I, I had an opportunity last year to do as well was to be become a, a grief recovery specialist. So I have a, a business where I also do grief recovery. It's an eight-week program to help people through their grief. Um, this time last year, my wife passed away from COVID. Some of you may be aware of that or may not be aware of that. It's a, her one-year anniversary is coming up actually this Saturday. So the opportunity to go through that program, that process, was very helpful for me. And so I want to pass that on to be able to help others uh, in that process as well. And it's not just death. It's any kind of loss. Um, so if you're interested and like a little more information about that, then just see me afterwards. Uh, but this, this evening, I want to take some time for us, before we come to the Lord's table, to take a look at what, I, what really I've found to be a very explosive passage for me as I was working through this, <clears throat> and very helpful in many ways. So the process, what I've been doing on Sunday mornings, basically five points, five major points. We're going to take a look at the context. We'll take a look at the story. And then there are three specific questions that I ask about the text, and I'll give you those questions when we get to that. I'm going to ask you if you would just to follow along with me as I read from Mark's Gospel, Mark uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 45. And I'm reading from the ESV. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astonished, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennarzet and mourned to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people in their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we recognize that any time we come to gather as your people, to hear your word proclaimed, we do stand upon holy ground. And so, Father, I ask that in our time together this evening that you would give us understanding of this passage, that you might apply it to our hearts. Father, that we would seek to live lives of holiness before you. 
Father, you would show us our sin, but that you'd also show us the comfort of your grace and mercy. And this I pray in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Now, let's take a look just for a moment here at the context. If we go back just a, a little ways, we'll see that Jesus is feeding the 5,000. And we see that that is a, a, quite a task in and of itself. Now, the feeding of the 5,000, of course, is the only uh, story, mir or miracle rather, that is recorded in all four Gospels. Now, what I mean by that is you'll have some miracles that are recorded in a couple of the Gospels, and maybe a miracle here or there that's not recorded in the other Gospels, but in one Gospel. But this is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. And we can understand why, because it's so miraculous. I mean, you're feeding 5,000 men, 5,000 people here, not counting the others that were there as well. So we see that there is this feeding of the 5,000. And no doubt that was a very difficult task for them. If you remember, the disciples were like, let's send them away, Jesus. You know, we're hungry, let's send them away. Um, you know, they can go to McDonald's, their buffet might be open, just send them out. We don't want, you know, we don't have the, the need or, I mean, the funds or anything to feed them. But Jesus said, no, you need to take care of this. So that's the context. So you can imagine feeding 5,000 people, what that would be like. Now, in Charlotte, there's a church that's called Calvary. It's actually called the Pink Cathedral. It holds the 13th largest pipe organ in the world in that facility. It's the only church I've ever been in or ever seen that actually had an escalator, up and down escalator. So it's a pretty, pretty large place. Uh, Ross Rhodes, who started that church way back, uh, he, was, he was a Presbyterian. He left the Presbyterian denomination, the PCUSA, and started this church. And his whole philosophy was, let's feed them. And so that's how they started, in the parks there in Charlotte. Began feeding people, sharing the gospel, and so on. But that church, though, is able, because of its facility, they can feed 1,000 people in 15 minutes. Because they have special kitchen, they have special ovens, they have special way in which they carry. Can you imagine 1,000 people, 15 minutes to feed? That's a lot of people. Here you have 12 men. And what others might be part of that? And they've got to feed over 5,000. And we know that Jesus puts them together, but that's got to be a very time-consuming thing. Now, that's what I want you to grasp here. I, I want you to get a sense of really what is going on. These are men who, first of all, didn't want to feed these people, who are now having to feed these people, and are having to take the time to feed all of these people. And we're, we already know from the text that their hearts are hardened about the whole thing, they're doing this very begrudgingly. And yet Jesus in his compassion says you need to feed them. So if we go to verse 40 here in chapter 6. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them and they all ate and were satisfied they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Again, not counting women and children. Then we have the next verse. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Now, what we see here, again, is part of the context. Very busy, very tired men. And Jesus sends them in a boat to go to the other side. He dismisses the crowds. And Jesus himself is going to take some time and go and spend with the Father. That's the context that we see going on here. So we need to note, though, the time and condition. Again, these disciples are tired and hungry themselves. They wanted to send a crowd away. Jesus said to feed the crowd, even though they didn't know how. Jesus did this wonderful, miraculous miracle here. They observed it, this feeding of the 5,000. But then we'll see, though, in verse 46, that to take a leave of them, he went up to the mountain. Uh, in verse 47, when evening came, the boat was out to sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making, that they were making headway 
uh, painfully, for the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, again, here's the context. What time is this? The fourth watch of the night is between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, I've done some late night fishing, Pava River, when I was in South Carolina, but I wasn't out there no 3 or 6 o'clock at night. I had someone to get home to, you know. I like to fish, but, you know, there's a limit to everything, I think. So I didn't want to do that. But they're tired. They're rowing against the wind, and it's late at night. Now, again, I want you to get a sense of what that might feel like. If you could put your feet in the sandals of those disciples, how would you feel? What would you think would be going on? And it's a difficult time for them. Again, the hour was late. And more than likely, they probably even left before that 3 o'clock hour because they're rowing against the wind. It's very difficult for them. So let's take a look at the story itself, though, just, just, by, way of, uh, just by way of understanding this. Because this story could actually be divided into four sections. The first section, of course, are the disciples themselves. They went away as noted. It is late for them, they're, but they're struggling against the wind. Now, these are seasoned men, most of them anyway, seasoned fishermen. This would have been nothing new for them. No doubt they may have been out at 3 o'clock. This would not have been the first time to be out so late in the evening. But they've not taken time to feed 5,000 men before either, have they? Circumstances are different here. So we see the disciples themselves, the condition that they're in. The second thing we see, though, is that the disciples and Jesus. Because in verse 48, we see that he saw, that as Jesus saw, they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And notice it said that he meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. Now, what does this mean, he meant to pass by them? Well, we'll take a look at that here in just a moment when we get to our second question. But what we see, though, is that Jesus is going to do something for the disciples. That's what he's about to do. He's about to do something for the disciples. And so he comes to them. They are terrified when they see him because it's not, they think it's an aberration. This was something very common even among sailors to think to see possible ghosts or, some, or spirits out on the water. They're very terrified, but Jesus comes. He calms them says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And of course, the sea is calm, and they're not struggling now against the wind. But 52, verse 52 says, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The miracle that has just taken place, they still don't get it. They still don't understand what's going on, and that makes even this, even though they're astonished that he stops the wind, there's something more here. Verse 53, when they had crossed over, this is Jesus in the crowd. This is the third section. You have Jesus in the crowd. When they had crossed over, they came to Gennarzet and more to the shore. And immediately we see all these people coming out. They recognize Jesus. Here's Jesus. They've heard about him. And so they begin bringing all their sick to him. They just want to touch the hem of his garment. And so we see that they're very, very... Um, very much pressing in. And don't forget, they just got rid of the kind of pressing. Did they not? Did Jesus and the disciples just not finish having that kind of pressing? Here it is, 6 o'clock in the morning. They, they pull up on shore. They recognize Jesus. And now you've got all of these people that are coming once again. Again, you can just imagine the tension that they're feeling and just the, just the, the, the angst. Can't we just have a little peace and quiet? But they don't get that. And then, of course, the last thing we see is the crowd itself. Not just Jesus and the crowd, but the crowd itself. If you look again at verse 58, for where, wherever he came in villages and cities and countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. So Jesus is recognized by the crowd as he comes ashore. The crowd has heard of him. 
They run to tell others. Now note there's a significant difference here, however, in what, we, what has been going on before between the disciples and the crowd. And here's the difference. The disciples are hard-hearted. The crowd is excited. It's Jesus. The disciples are hard-hearted, but the crowd is excited. Now, here's the three questions. Here's the first of the three questions. Number one, what does this text teach us about man's condition or predicament? And especially the believer. What does this section teach us, this text teach us, about the believer's condition and predicament? There are four things I want to point out to you. The first of these is the problem of fatigue. Tiredness can weaken our faith. Tiredness can weaken our faith. Think of Elijah, for example. Tiredness can change our attitude. Tiredness can cause us to focus on the wrong things. We see in their case, their tiredness, they didn't want to minister. They didn't want to minister to anybody. They just wanted to be by themselves. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever just been so tired that you really don't want to be around anybody? I mean, sometimes you get so tired, you don't even want your spouse to touch you. I just need a little, you know, R&R, Calgon, take me away. I just, just don't want to be near anybody. But fatigue will often weaken our faith. When I was, in the, when I was doing my CPE training, which is clinical pastoral education training uh, at Memorial Hospital uh, to be, to be a, a full-time, well, to be a board-certified chaplain, I met a man there on the heart unit that's in the fifth floor in the heart tower, if you know anything about Memorial. And he was a man that was, I found out, was a chaplain. And he had come into the hospital because of heart problems. And not only was he a chaplain, I found out he was a hospice chaplain, which is what I wanted to work, which was what I was working toward at that time. And he was in the hospital because he had something that is called compassion for Passion fatigue. For the last 10 years or so, he never took time off for himself. For the last 10 years or so, all he did was just spend time doing and working and giving and, and helping other people, not setting aside time for himself. And in that fatigue, it not only affected him in terms of his work, it began to affect him physically. And so he began to have heart issues as a result of that. And I can remember walking out of that room and saying to myself, if I'm not careful, I'm going to be just like him. Because as, as a pastor and as a chaplain, you give yourself away to people. You give your time and attention to people. And you, as, as workers within the church, you do that because you love the Lord, and that's the right thing to do. But let's face it, there are times, and I know many pastors, and I've been guilty of this myself, there comes a saturation point when you're doing and doing and doing when you become very cynical of people, even church people. And you don't want to really be around anybody. And you're wondering, Lord, is this really all worth it? I mean, I don't seem to be making headway anywhere. But you see, that's what fatigue will do. Fatigue and tiredness will certainly weaken our faith. In the case of the disciples, their hearts were hardened. Second thing, in terms of our condition and predicament, this also will cause a faulty focus. That is, we can often focus on the miraculous without ever seeing the one who brought it to pass. And that was the problem with the disciples here. Sure, they just saw the feeding of the 5,000. And yes, Jesus calmed the storm. But yet, they could still get out of the boat and say that their hearts were hardened. Why is that? Because they had lost their focus. They had a faulty focus. Their focus was on events. Their focus was on the miraculous. Their focus was not on Jesus. That's where their focus should have been. They saw the miraculous event, event but not the one who was behind that event. And if we're not careful, we see those same kind of things. We can, too, have a faulty focus just thinking that things are happening, things are making, taking place, things are going okay. But if we don't see 
Christ in the midst of it, then we really lose our focus. The third thing that we see here, though, is a false fidelity. A false fidelity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the crowd. So we take a look, we see that the crowd here, when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized Jesus, that is, and ran the whole region, began to bring the sick, sick people on their beds, wherever they heard he was. And wherever, wherever he was at, they brought people to him. Now, I'm sure it's the same in Matthew's gospel. I know Pete's been going through that. But I know here in Mark's gospel, anytime you have these miraculous events that are taking place, you always have Jesus preaching and teaching. Here we don't see Jesus preaching and teaching. Now, I'm not saying, I, I don't think that he's neglecting that. It's just that the text doesn't record that for us. So what does that mean then? That means that here are the people that they're putting, they're putting their faith and their hope and their trust in what Jesus can do for them. They're not hanging on to the very words of Jesus himself. They're not caught up in what Jesus says certainly what he does, and we want to be caught up in what he does, but that's never apart from what he says because of who he is. He is, after all, the healer, but he's also the living word. So what he says is just as important as what he does. But here they had a false fidelity, I believe, because they were more concerned about the healing rather than the word of Jesus himself. And another thing we see here, I think, is a problem in our condition or predicament. And that is simply that we're often caught off guard by life circumstances. We're often caught off guard by life circumstances. We, we wake up in the morning, you know, it's, we don't have the luxury of a TV playing before us with the screen saying, okay, here's how your day is going to be. We just don't have that. And often that causes fear. And that is our condition and our predicament at times. It is simply fear. Now, one thing I want you to note here about the disciples themselves, if you look at, again, at the text, in verse 47, <clears throat> and when evening came, the boat was out of the sea, and he was alone on the land, that is Jesus, but he, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Are there some days when you feel like you're rowing against the wind? Have there been events that have taken place in your life recently where you feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like I'm rowing against the wind. You see, we are often caught off guard by our circumstances, so the disciples even though they were experienced fishermen, many of them anyway, they, were, they found that it was much more difficult than anticipated. They'd been out in the boat hundreds of times, thousands of times, but for some reason, this late night, it was just hard. And they were pressing hard to try to row against this wind to go from one part, one part to the other. And it was so difficult. And there are just sometimes when life circumstances hit us between the eyes, things that are so unexpected and we're caught off guard by it. And there is fear. And then note, Jesus even brought more fear because they thought it was a ghost. <laughs> Again, unexpected. Very unexpected. No doubt some of you have had that in the last year yourself, maybe with the death of a loved one. Certainly no one knew anything about this COVID. When I'm at the hospital working, I try to get reports to find out how many patients do we have right now at the hospital. Thankfully, the numbers are finally beginning to trickle down a little bit. But I tell you, in the very beginning when this thing was really hitting, there was fear among the, the doctors. There was fear among the nurses didn't know what to do. I mean, people, were, their senses were heightened. And even now, 
because of the, the sudden rise again, and again we're beginning to see that come down, so unexpected. And that brings fear because we can't always anticipate what's going to happen in life. Can we? We know things are going to happen. Be nice to know when. But even then, that would bring fear. That would bring fear. And so Jesus brought more fear. He brought more, he brought more fear than hope and relief because they didn't understand what they were seeing. Sometimes we don't understand what we're seeing either. Sometimes we don't understand which way the wind is going to blow us. But that brings us to the second question. And that is this. What does this story reveal about Jesus that is new or reinforces what we already know about him? Let me say that again. What does this story reveal to us about Jesus that is new maybe something you don't know, or reinforces what you already know about him. Turn with me to, we're going to look at two Old Testament passages right quick. In 1 Kings, you'll turn there just for a moment to 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. First King chapter 19, this is the situation where the Lord speaks to Elijah. You're hopefully familiar with this story. Um, he is, he is uh, fled from Jezebel, and not because he's afraid of Jezebel, uh, though that's a common thing, but, but I don't believe he's afraid of Jezebel at all. But uh, he comes to the cave here in verse 9. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it also. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Now let me read that again. This is what God says to Elijah. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire the sound of a low whisper. Now, did you catch that phrase, and the Lord passed by? Let's look also in the book of Exodus, just for a moment. Here in Exodus chapter 33, and no doubt you're familiar with this as well. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 19. This is where Moses inquires of the Lord. And Moses says, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So now, there we see again, the Lord is passing by. Now let's look at our text again here in Mark's Gospel. Because the way this is written, it seems almost funny. It seems as if it says, at least in the ESV, and I've looked at other translations, and they're all somewhat similar. But he says, about the fourth night, and he came then walking on the sea, he meant to pass them by. Now, what this does not mean, this is not you in the grocery store seeing somebody down the aisle that you really don't want to take time to talk to, so you pass by to the next aisle so you don't have to talk to them. You've done that. I've done that. We've all done that. That's not what Jesus is doing here. 
Jesus is not wanting to sneak by them so that they don't see. But what this means is, is that Jesus, he sees them in their need. He knows that his disciples are tired. He knows that they are rowing against the wind. He knows that it is late at night. And so what he wants to do is to pass by them. That is, he wants to show them his glory. That's what he wants to do. He wants to show them himself in not only his humanity, but in his deity. And he desires that he would pass by them that they may behold his glory. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I finally came to understand what that really meant, man, I tell you, that, that was so comforting to know that in the midst of my trials and difficulties, whenever I am roaring against the wind, that the Lord desires to pass by, that he would show me his glory. That was very evident to me. A year ago, with my wife in the hospital, over 40 days of handling, on a ventilator. Peace that God gave to me. Isaiah 41 13 just resonated within my heart. And that even in those times, knowing the darkness, knowing that I was growing against the wind, knowing that my children, too, growing against the wind, how he longed to pass by. To show me his glory. And that he did. So that I could have peace in the midst of that storm. That's what Jesus is doing to here. Longing to pass by them. He passes by them to show them the splendor and the glory of who he is. Committing himself to them in a most powerful way. And not only to show them his glory but to show them his goodness because he is going to join them in that boat and then to show them his grace because he stops the storm. Now, Jesus doesn't always stop our storms. But Jesus is always with us because he always longs to pass by. He always longs to show us himself. There are four things here that I believe reveal in this story about Jesus' glory, let me just say that briefly. Number one, we see in his glory the knowledge of Christ himself because he saw his disciples as he was passing by. He saw their struggle. And I can guarantee you, dear brothers and sisters, there's not anything that you're faced today or tomorrow or next week or next year that the Lord Jesus doesn't know about. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with our grief. He knows everything about you. And he longs to pass by you to display his glory. Because he has knowledge of you. He knows every hair upon your head, and some he counts a lot, and some he doesn't. <laughs> but he knows. The other thing we see is his power. Because the sea becomes his footpath. Isn't that beautiful? That the sea becomes his footpath. And yet he calms the wind. We see his love because they were in distress. And he doesn't merely just stop the storm. He gets them to the boat with him. Ever present. Ever present. But then we also see his admonition here to his disciples. Guys, don't be afraid. And what does he say? Take heart. It is I. Learn about that few weeks ago, he was preaching about Moses. I am that I am. I am who I am. I am in my, all my essence who I am. And Jesus says the same thing here. It is I. In all his glory, his admonition so to be afraid. Do not be afraid, that is. And he reveals that deity, his deity to his disciples. And so what's the last question, quickly? So what does this story reveal about man's condition or predicament? What does this story reveal about Jesus that is new or reinforces what we already know? And here's the last question. So what do we see as the solution to our condition? 
If our problem is fear and fatigue and these things, what is the solution that this text offers to us? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that we will always have hardships and we will always be roaring against the wind. Brothers and sisters, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. And if anyone ever told you that when you became a believer, the life was going to be all butterflies and unicorns, they fed you a great big lie. Because it's not. We live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world. But we also have a Savior who comes alongside of us. So we need to make sure that we recognize that hardships are always near. As a matter of fact, it's often one of three things. You're either in the middle of a crisis, or you're, you're getting ready to come out of a crisis, or you're getting ready to go into a crisis. <laughs> That's just kind of the world in which we live in. The second thing is a solution. We need to trust in Christ and in his power. Not our ability, but in his power. Third thing, we need to make sure that we live in his presence and understand what that really means. Living daily in his presence. We need to understand that it's not merely a feeling or a sense that he's with us, but it is a true knowledge and it is faith that takes him at his word because Jesus is always passing by. Jesus is always near. Jesus always desires to display to us his glory. And the most beautiful way in which we see that is at this table here. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ displaying his glory and coming near to us. One thing I love about the Lord's Supper, is that it is a time for covenant renewal. It is a time for us to renew our covenant faithfulness to God because he reminds us of his covenant faithfulness to us. I often tell the folks at chapel that the Lord's Supper is the gospel for our senses. We see it. We smell it. We taste it. We touch it. We know it there, and we take that by faith. Are you struggling here tonight? Are you rowing against the wind? Is there something that's taking place in your life that you feel like it's the dark hour of the night and you just long for Jesus to come by? Dear brothers and sisters, as you come to the table this evening, I guarantee you, based on the authority of God's word and of his love, he is ever present and he will come by. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, that you do desire to, to display your glory to us each and every day. And Lord, we know there are hardships. We know there are difficulties. We know there are days when we feel like we're just pressing and running and beating the wind. But, Father, you long to come near, and I thank you for that. I thank you that you are the God of grace, mercy, I pray that even now you would come near. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.